Goedemiddag. Goedemiddag. Goedemiddag, welkom iedereen. Hallo en welkom everyone. Uh, my name is Samuel Saalmakers. I'm a curator here uh, based in Rotterdam at Witte de Wit Center for Contemporary Art. Um, and I am here as the uh, editor of the publication that we will be talking about today. I'll start by maybe briefly sketching what preceded the publication. In 2014, uh, author of the book, art historian and curator Marianne Grauer, present here, um, curated two exhibitions, uh, one here in Rotterdam at Witte de Wit, and one at the Ullen Center for Contemporary Art in Beijing. And both of the exhibitions um, covered the life and work of uh, the man of the hour, Hans van Dijk. Following these exhibitions, we uh, had already begun the work uh, for this catalog, which is not a catalog, is much more than a catalog, it is a biography, it is an art historical um, book, it is the fruit of many years of research done um, by Mariana. So it is with great pride and joy that um, we are presenting it to you today. Before uh, Mariana and I will talk about some of the um, central themes and, and, and issues that lay in this, in this story and in this book. I have been, um, I've taken upon me the daunting task of uh, telling you who Hans van Dijk was, which as you can see requires a big book, but unfortunately we have limited time here, so I will do my best. And I will stick to maybe what is actually the first chapter of the book, which is um, to give you a context of where Hans came from before he did everything he did in China, working with so many artists uh, that he did. So I'll begin with that, and then uh, Marianne will join me for a Q&A. So Hans van Dijk was born on the 19th of November in 1946 in the town of Deventer, situated in the Dutch Bible Belt. As a teenager, he attends the Arnhem Academy of Fine Arts, and it's important to know that among his teachers, there were two uh, Dutch artists who have, who have a lasting influence on him, namely Henk Peters and Peter Struck, who some of you might know. Peters, whose work uh, contains the same that, that pan humor uh, that appealed to Hans van Dijk, is a member of the International Zero Movement, and Struyke, a great admirer of Mondrian, soon becomes the first Dutch artist to create a systemic computer-based art. From 1965 to 69, Van Dijk is enrolled in the Academy of Industrial Design in Eindhoven, a progressive open-minded institute and the only Bauhaus-oriented academy in the Netherlands. After graduating from the academy, Van Dijk lives the difficult life of an artist, occasionally exhibiting, but struggling to find his way. He earns his money by working in commercial advertising, making billboards and other display systems, which I think in hindsight is very much also a curatorial undertaking, creating displays for other elements. From 1970 to the early 1980s, he develops an art practice inspired by the advent of computation, making works that are the result of numeric systems that play with color, line thickness and geometric patterns. A few examples of those are here. This is a work called Serie 4, Serie 4. It's a set of 27 drawings um, that all follow a different system uh, of variations. And then this is, these are colors, tests for colored um, paintings that he made. And these are Arranged Patterns, is the title, from 1982. Small plaques on uh, plastic. And here we have a wonderful image of Hans van Dijk on the far left, uh, exhibiting at Sally East Gallery in London in 1982. And you can see inside the gallery the works that we just saw uh, before, the arranged patterns and the uh, color block painting. Here's a, another close-up. Around 1983, van Dijk uh, makes a discovery that changes the course of his life. He had always been interested in carpentry and design, uh, and so he buys a book on antique Chinese furniture. Uh, the book is a reprint from the 1944 publication Chinese Domestic Furniture in Photographs and Measured Drawings by Gustav Ecker, who was a German professor in art and architectural history. Van Dijk wanted to study the techniques presented in the book, 
yet cannot decipher the often cryptic instructions, let alone read, of course, the Chinese origin. And after having been snubbed by the professors of the Sinology department at Lehrer University for asking them to help him translating carpentry instructions, Van Dijk sets out to learn Chinese on his own. And the result of his zealous studies is a series of furniture that Van Dijk described as Ming-inspired Rietveld furniture. He makes these for his closest friends, but refuses to produce them on any commercial scale, uh, which we will talk about that later on, is characteristic for Hans's refusal of entering any kind of mass-produced commercial uh, area. This is one. Also, the, uh, the folding screens behind the table are also his design. These are two other examples. And there's this one. And during this period, so the mid-80s, uh, many of Van Dijk's friends begin to marry and settle down. And having given up his art practice and driven, up, driven by his interest in Chinese culture, at nearly 40 years old, Hans van Dijk decides to move to China, where he enrolls at the Nanjing University to study calligraphy and language. What follows next, until his passing in 2002 in Beijing, is an incredible series of encounters with Chinese artists, a tireless commitment to their work and never-ending effort to exhibit it in China as well as in Europe. One of his major curatorial accomplishments is, in this regard was the 1993 touring exhibition China Avant-Garde, which uh, opened in 93 in Berlin and then traveled across Europe also to the Kunsthal here in Rotterdam. Uh, these are two of the catalogues, the Chinese and the English version of the catalog of China Avant-Garde. And here is an install view uh, with a main installation by Mihai Feng artist based in Amsterdam still today. Uh, and this is the this is as exhibition as it was at the Kunsthal here in Rotterdam. China Avant-Garde was one of the first comprehensive exhibitions of Chinese contemporary art in the West. While the publication that we are presenting here today offers a detailed overview of the many exhibitions Van Dijk curated during the decade or so he lived in China. I will shortly zoom in on two particularly striking connections that come to the fore in the book and that to me say a lot about not only who Hans Van Dijk was but also about how history understood as art history, world history but also personal history works and unfolds. So we're going back to 1968 uh, more precisely to Czechoslovakia. As part of his studies at the Antwerpen Academy, Van Dijk interns at the design department of the Chirana Medical Instruments Factory near Bratislava. And there he experiences the impact of the Prague Spring, which begins on the 5th of January 1968. His first hand witnessing of the protests for freedom and democracy, followed by his brutal repression by the Soviet Union, is repeated when, in 1989, he takes part in the student, pro student protests in Nanjing and in other cities in China, which end, as we know, in the Tiananmen massacre on the 4th of June. In both instances, Van Dijk is forced to leave the country. Van Dijk keeps a detailed diary during the uprising in China in the summer of uh, 89, and the book contains excerpts from his day-to-day -day account of the events. And then on the 11th of July, when it became clear he had to return to the Netherlands, he wrote this... Uh, in his Memories of the last days in Prague 1968. Short, reticent conversations when people understand you are no accidental tourist. The rumor mill, the broad broadcast, the artificial inflation, the occupation of communist centers, brave journalists, the roving channels, the condescending jokes about farmer soldiers, the national sense of fatality. Just like them, I feel a strong sense of unity through knowledge, yet remain an outsider, an observer more than ever. The fact that he was a, that he described himself as an observer, I think, uh, is something we see throughout most of his uh, life and many of his undertakings. Um, and what we see here, or, or uh, images that are also in the book, quite rare images of uh, protest banners that um, hung in Hangzhou in China on the 7th of June in 1989. And they show paintings 
or the banners or paintings uh, based on photos of victims shot in, a, shot in a Tiananmen Square. And the banners hung uh, on a square in front of the Academy of uh, Zhejiang in Hangzhou. And they hung there for three days because people were too afraid to take them down. These photographs were sent to Hans van Dijk by Zhang Peili and Gang Zhang Yi, two artists. And I think that says a lot as well, that these artists knew Hans van Dijk to be interested in these facts and they trusted him with these very delicate images, um, which to this day uh, are pro problematic images to, to show or distribute in mainland China. Another more art-driven relation that comes through in the book is this one. Oh, this is another of the banners. This is a landscape painting made by Hans van Dijk based on a systematic color scheme. He made it around 1969 or 70. And when we fast forward to the work of artist Mai Jishong, the affinities are striking. This is a landscape series number four, a painting by uh, Mai Jishong from 1995. Van Dijk included this and other works by the artist in an exhibition titled Mondrian in China, a documentary exhibition with Chinese originals. And the title of it is exemplary of the tongue-in-cheek humor that uh, was so typical for Hans van Dijk. The exhibition was sponsored by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who wanted to promote Mondrian worldwide. Yet no original Mondrian painting was ever shown in these exhibitions. The Dutch part, part of the show consists of reproductions of original works, posters and other educational material, which you can see in the bottom right of the image. And there you see a series of uh, Mai Shon paintings. Um, What's interesting also is that this exhibition took place not in a museum or a gallery, but in a luxury hotel in Beijing, which is indicative of the complete absence of any infrastructure for Chinese contemporary art at the time. And Van Dijk sees the occasion of this exhibition, which rarely uh, at the time, and also for Van Dijk, actually had a budget, to embrace all of these abstract painters that had a hard time also in China, because uh, abstract art in China at the time was also not considered um, or wasn't common, let's say. Um, so it was a, a, a very interesting exhibition, I think, this combination of these uh, archival materials on, on Beat Mondrian's work and then it's quite like these two Ding Yi's <coughs> hanging in the back. Uh, Ding Yi, an artist yeah. that Hans van Dijk uh, worked with throughout um, all of his life. So these were two highlights. Uh, of many in the book, which show, I think, these kind of long arches in, in one person's life and how, um, when you look at it in detail, everything is related. Um, I think I will now invite Marianne Brouwer to the stage to talk about the book further. Thank you. And while we get settled, what will run on the screen uh, is... Um, the entire book, so you get a sense of uh, all its content. As in the entire book. The entire book. Oh. <laughs> all of it. So, Mariano, thank you, first and foremost, for all your hard work on making this book, which is an absolute treat for us also. Uh, and I speak also, I believe, on behalf of UCCA, but definitely also a little bit that it is a um, tour de force to publish a book like this. Um, so thank you very much for that. You're most welcome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Samuel, for your wonderful introduction about Hans. Um, I think it's fantastic that people become so enthusiastic, even your generation. Mm. Um, whereas I think it's, you know, it's very hard to get real enthusiasm for history or for um, historical events or people these days. And so I'm, I'm all the more grateful for you. And, and of course, before we go to any other place in this conversation, can I welcome everybody and thank you for coming. And um, I want to thank a few people here who have been, first of all, um, absolutely indispensable in making both the exhibitions and the books and the book. Um, first of all, it's uh, Hans van Dijk's family. And um, then there is Pascal Guillaume, 
without both of whom could not have the, the exhibitions couldn't have happened. I'm really from the bottom of my heart I'm very grateful. And then there are uh, Hans's friends who well you some of you are here in the in the in the audience, you know who you are. So thank you. And um, there are Hans's friends who kept his letters uh, for actually without really realizing how much um, how useful they would be one day. This book is based mostly on his correspondence with his friends in the Netherlands, telling about his adventures in China. Um, and uh, on, there's another person who he sent letters to on a regular basis, and that was uh, a German uh, artist and curator with whom Hans together curated the 1993 um, exhibition in Berlin a touring exhibition which went from Berlin to uh, Rotterdam, the Kunsthal, and then maybe maybe some of you saw it there, and uh, then to Oxford and back to um, Germany. And so <coughs> all, all people, everyone I've met um, has been so incredibly helpful because Hans was very, very much loved. And um, everybody wanted a piece of him. So everybody in, in, in his memory uh, had the feeling of having participated in something unique. And that also goes for all the artists who have contributed to this book where with being available for interviews, um, having in their archive having letters and, and all sorts of things. Um, that have been helpful to making uh, the shows and the book to what it is. So basically all I did was research how to put it all together. Shall we, shall so we go back to the... Can, I, can yes. I, I need to thank you as well. And, and I want to thank Phil um, uh, from UCCA, uh, Phil Tinari, the director of UCCA. I want to thank Sophia, who the current director of um, uh, the Tedewit who can't be here today, and Daphne Ayas, who is somewhere between Moscow and, and Berlin, uh, and can't be here today either. But without them, the book would not have been what it is. And you, dear Samuel, we've had our differences in the we've course had, of we've time. We've had our work. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm so glad we both win today. We do, so yes. So that is the best, the best conclusion that we could have I had so for too. this book. I Thank you, so. Samuel for editing that book and organizing it. And before I forget, Patrick Ryan from UCC needs big thanks for doing editing the text and doing the fact finding. Thank you so much all. Um, okay. Shall we go back to when, before all of this was done, I think it was 2013? 12, actually 12. When, and then we began the conversation about the exhibition at Witte de Witt. Oh, that was 13, yeah. Why, how did that come about? Why, why this book, why those exhibitions? What was it that drew, drew you to the material? Um, oh, that, that, actually, that story starts somewhere in basically my interest in China, which I have had for, from childhood. I always wanted to go to China, Japan, and Iran, those three countries. And um, thank God, um, Fate has led me to two of them, to live there and, and work there. And um, so, uh, in 85, when China opened, I went to Beijing just for a holiday, basically. And I was, of course, want, I wanted to know uh, whether there was an art scene or not, but I couldn't find anything. Later that year, in 85, there was the big, big exhibition by Robert Rauschenberg in Beijing. And Rauschenberg's exhibition was a shock to the, ch to the Chinese, budding art world. 85 was the year that saw the beginning of a trend a new, called New Wave in China, which was the beginning of the contemporary art scene, uh, and with paintings which now fetch millions of dollars. But in those days, people were poor, uh, they were just coming from the, the, the absolute hazards and horrible times of cultural revolution. That was, they were 
like the first generation of artists that, that because the schools had been closed during the Cultural Revolution, the first generation of artists coming, um, graduating from those art academies. That was 1985. And um, I couldn't find any art then, but it was there. It was definitely there. You had to know where to look. And, um, but not in a week. And certainly, probably not in Beijing at the time. Hong Zhou was the, the place to be in those days. Um, because the director of the art academy was an incredibly um, wide, ramdenkend, how do you say? Um, Broad-minded. Broad and, and actually he loved the contemporary art as it started to develop itself. And there are big names attached to these days, like Wang Yongping and Gu Da and uh, Chai Wo Chang, um, whose works are world famous now. But in those days, they were starting to find a voice for all the developments, the modernization, everything that had happened in China in the meantime, in the Mao days, and of which they emerged um, bruised. Bruised, um, which was visible in the later, in the so-called scar art about um, Chinese, about the, the, the that was the critical art about the Cultural Revolution made by artists who had emerged as red gods and then were abandoned by Mao, for instance. So there was a broad range of classical art, um, meaning um, uh, painting, historical art, historical of historical classical painting and calligraphy. Then there was the oil painting. The, all of it was supervised by the state. Uh, so the socialist realism, all of it, and, um, with the idea that the um, government, and which is a very old Chinese idea, that government and politics, government and people and arts are, um, um, are linked in one single culture. And that if, if you only have a government, if you don't have art with it, that there is something essential that is lost. We could say that. Today, we could repeat that for uh, a few people in our government. Um, and so, this whole idea of, but of course, it also led to very close censorship of, um, of paintings and, and of, of the arts. So, so, you found this scene incredibly interesting because it was in this pivotal moment where it became something after yeah. the traumatic events of the Cultural yeah. Revolution. And actually, in Beijing in those days was a really... It was totally different from what it's now. Um, and, but you had the feeling that there, was some, that there was some kind of energy going on there. That if, you, if set free, I had the feeling that Beijing would, be, would become the city of mm. the year 2000. Mm. And actually, everybody thought I was absolutely mad mm. because people were still walking on mud roads in, even in the city. Mm -hmm. but and then one year later, in, in 86, Hans van der arrived in this China that you encountered in Exactly, 85. which was still pretty much the same mm. um, um, as uh, one year later. He arrived one year later and uh, started studying in, at the uh, Nanjing University of the Arts where he met with artists they were, they were, and art theory. That was <coughs> art theory and art criticism were also debating what Chinese art should become in those modern Deng Xiaoping mm. times. Mm. Um, and so he fell with his nose in the butter, as we say in, in Holland, <coughs> um, because there was big polemics going on between one writer, uh, who was then not even a professor at uh, the Arts Institute in Nanjing, but a fourth year student, who wrote a scathing article that um, Chinese painting, so, um, which was by the time the, the, official, the official painting of China, uh, so our calligraphy and, and landscape painting, were completely obsolete. They had to be changed, and they had to be changed radically because they were not just obsolete, but um, 
fossilized and so on. So it was a big attack and there was an enormous discussion in the newspapers about this article, which was later on translated by Hans. So indeed, as we know, or uh, as it's illustrated in the book, Hans, um, Hans van Dijk began investigating these movements, encountering these artists, documenting these uh, texts, making translations. But could, could, could you talk a bit about his situation as a foreigner at the time, how he was able to um, live in China then, as, especially as opposed to when he returned in 93, which was a very different situation? Um. In a way, it was a golden time for foreigners in China because, um, well, there was there were certain restrictions. As a foreigner, you couldn't take the, the metro in, in Beijing, for instance, these that kind of things. But um, basically, there were no, there was nobody. Uh, he met the artists straight away. He went to Hangzhou and, and Shanghai, where he met Ding Yi. He went to Hangzhou, where he met uh, with Mihai Fang, with with. Wu. <coughs> Wang Yongping, he met every everybody in the Chinese art scene in person, and people talked, and because his, his Chinese in the beginning was not very good, but <coughs> he was a very diligent student, and in contrast to what certain people believe later on, he was not rich, uh, very often Chinese saw foreigners as just being rich and coming and tell, telling Chinese what to do. But Hans was not rich. He was on a one-to-one, also because he was an artist himself, on a one-to-one -one basis. Oh, here, this is, we should, maybe, you are right. Um, these are absolute first exhibitions in China after 1989. Uh, it took two years before that is uh, one word that is uh, Yu Yo Han. Um, the, it took two years after 1989. These are the conditions that Hans lived in uh, uh, in hotels. Um, and those are two artists of the No Name group, which, which was a precursor of the New Wave group. Um, so there's, there's, at the moment that Hans arrives, the whole art scene in China is suddenly sprouting, blooming, with discussions, with paintings, with um, uh, and, and Hans gets it all and he starts collecting. He's, he's, he uh, gets a subscription to eight magazines, art, new art magazines, um, and collects the articles. He collects and he puts everything he sees and reads on little cards. And he collects images. Like we used to art historical students all know we all had shoe boxes with all our images in, um, uh, of, of art historical, of works. And so he, he lives there, 89 happens, all of that is shut down for a couple of years as you said, yeah. then slowly towards 92, 93 there is an opening up again, slowly contemporary art is emerging again, and this is when Hans van Dijk decides to permanently install himself, to start living in Beijing, and he, he never returns to to the Netherlands. Um, well, he does, he does. Every to year to, to visit to his family, yes. to go to the exhibitions and so on. Almost every year, I think, he went back mm. to Holland. And so during that time that he is, is living and working there, he is both a curator and an art dealer. I think it would be interesting to talk about that specific aspect of, of, of his, um, his work, the art dealing, perhaps, it, um, at, at that time. Because this is before the art market as we know it. That's why it's also interesting to talk about this, com the, this, this topic here at an art fair, because there's so many cliches about art in China and the market and the hype around Chinese contemporary art, and the entire history of this book precedes that hype, <coughs> yeah. I would say. Actually, when Hans died, the hype was started mm. in uh, 2002. Um, but what about but the, the, the art dealings he did? Well, actually, I was a consultant, and the first thing, he, he had three, three um, objectives. One was to establish a gallery, which he only succeeded to do in doing in 1999, actually, a real gallery. Up to then, he had a real problem with visa. He had to go back, he had to go to Hong Kong for a visa every three months. And in those days, that was a three-day trip yeah. by train, because the trains were incredibly slow. Um, back and forth, so you were you, you lost a week going to Hong Kong. 
Um, anyway, what he wanted to do was to open a, a, a gallery, which he didn't succeed in in those days. Uh, he rented spaces um, as much as he could. And in the meantime, um, did, ex and did exhibitions with uh, galleries, with uh, the artists. And sometimes two thirds of those exhibitions were either forbidden or didn't, didn't happen. And so his biggest, his greatest achievement actually uh, was to uh, introduce a uh, Chinese artist to the West because that always he was a, as a, he acted as a consultant for foreign museums, galleries, and so on, and uh, sold works. Uh, the, the, there was no no market. Uh, contemporary art was not allowed to. You couldn't sell it. Uh, after 1989, before that, the, the situation was rather open. After 1989, it closed um, irrevocably. So you couldn't sell uh, contemporary art, which was called, in China, it's called experimental art. You couldn't sell it. You couldn't uh, exhibit it. You could make it. That was about all. So how did Chinese artists <coughs> succeed in selling? And that was very, very hard. So um, Hans helped with that. And um, he was the first, the first uh, person at all to establish a real gallery focused on the artists and not on commerce. Mm -hmm. There was one other gallery, the Red Gate Gallery, but that was a very commercial, sort of uh, easy, easy selling kind of place. And Hans was the one who had a theoretical analysis of contemporary art. He, his, he had a, a predilection for, uh, for conceptual art, mm -hmm. especially when artists stopped making, stopped painting, stopped making traditional art and wondered what to do next. Mm -hmm. And that was the art he picked up. And I think with it also with a lot of reference to Holland, um, in the sense that in those days where he, when he grew up and when he started living in Eindhoven and being an artist, uh, he had the examples of the stadium and of the, and you can see that quite clearly in his installations. That kind of aesthetic minimalism mm. that was very involved in those days. I remember does, it, does that answer? Does it? Do you? I know? think yes, no, no. I think it's going to sketch the the context of, of um, in which but he was working. Let me say that ninety yes. three, for instance, um, uh, when Ayoé came from um, yeah. uh, from New York, uh, back from his exile in New York. Uh, Hans met him, and in 1995 he was the first person to introduce Ayoé's work in Europe. But not only Ayoé's, other artists um, who have become really, really famous and important. Well, Hans was the first to show them, um, to love them, because he loved being... And the thing is, he never lived with, he never lived as a foreigner, he lived with the artists, as poor as they were. There were days that they had nothing to eat. And really, you would have maybe one frozen shrimp that they would share. <laughs> These are true stories. It's not a mm -hmm. And of course, the censorship. And Hans was gay. <coughs> that was another thing, which was forbidden in China. So he took huge risks with his own life, with his being able to stay in China, all in order to promote this art, which he was convinced was the best possible art in China. Can you speak a bit about the um, place of art critics in China and how Hans had to relate to that system? Hans, it, first of all, I have to say, Hans did write. Mm. He was a gifted, an incredibly gifted writer. And I wish we could have you know, published all, everything he wrote because it's funny, it's erudite, it is, it's great writing. But we, we chose to publish the letters that are about art, but not his observations on China, or very few of it. Um, but everything he did was worth reading. So he also published a, a big art historical essay, which was uh, published in the Leiden uh, University newspaper, which we included in the book. And please read it when you get the book, because it's a fantastic, very short history, but very concise, of Chinese art from 1982, the first, the, the, when the academies were open, and the first, the first, um, like the generation of Huang Yongping, um, up till 1989, and um, where he wonders what will happen to Chinese art, and um, so 
he started writing, publishing in China, in Chinese, in, uh, in, a, in a magazine that was very important in those days, was the art magazine Jiangsu. Um, and the problem is that the art critics in China are all politicized because art is part of the government. And um, so there were critics, the, uh, uh, analysis, and people like Ang Ling Lu, who, who created the first avant-garde exhibition in China in 1989, a few months before um, the massacre of 4 June, which shows how open people were prepared to be. Um, Later, later on became very nationalistic as an art critic. And um, so there's, there's, the problem was that there was no independent art history. And it is impossible for anyone really to, I need to t t talk and tell an anecdote. <clears throat> I met somebody from South Africa, I was a, uh, in, in Beijing or somewhere in China, who was asked by the city of Shanghai to create a, the story uh, of, for a museum to be built, a, a city historical museum to be built in Shanghai. And he said he gave up after seven tries. He was famous for making a program for, for um, history museums or even locomotive museums or things like that. Um, he was famous for that. And so they had invited him. But uh, you could not, he told me, he couldn't make a program because so many gaps in the history. There were things you couldn't talk about, you couldn't show. And the problem was not that it was fixed. The problem was that things would change. And so one day you couldn't show this, the other day you couldn't show that. So it was absolutely impossible to make a really concise and consistent kind of walk through. Mm. The same thing goes for the art critics. Things are not to be mentioned. Things cannot. So that's censorship. And I think censorship is one of the worst, poisonous kind of things in, that can happen to people in a dictatorship, even if it's a one-party dictatorship, because it's mind-poisoning. People become um, paranoid. They become, they don't know what, what is true. I mean, it, it is as if we all lived on fake news every day, um, without any kind of reference to what is true and what is not. And Big Brother watching all the time. So the, the art critics thought that Hans writing about art and publishing about art, two, two small articles actually, was a kind of power uh, grip by a foreigner. And they all started to shun him and, and say nasty things. So Hans, who was dreaded politics, um, did, stood back and never published or wrote anything about Chinese art again, except to his friends in, in the Netherlands. And, and to uh, Andrea Schmidt. Should we, or would we perhaps talk about the methodology of your research, especially the interviews you conducted? Or the difference, there were the, the letters you combed through, there were the interviews you conducted. It would, would be interesting to hear from you how you went about those and why you felt they were necessary or valuable to do. Well, actually, I never, I never meant for these interviews to be published in the first place. It was really to establish what Hans had been doing in China and where he went and who he knew and who, um, and what the other. Actually, when I was in 96, I was in, in Shanghai, Beijing, um, and <clears throat> for the first time saw these artists and to, uh, spoke with them. And I mean, there's so many. This book is for them as well, for that generation. Actually, Andrea Schmidt told me that um, uh, the situation is so commercial, so totally commercialized now in China that this generation is maybe the last one. Um, I won't say they didn't care about money, but it's maybe um, this. Anyway, this this ex this book and the exhibitions are dedicated to them. I think Hans would have wanted that. He would never have wanted a book about himself or exhibitions about himself. But that generation of artists, which he promoted and supported and lived like they did. Um, so what was the question? What, what were some of the common findings in these interviews with these artists? What did you find they, they were telling you? 
Well, the only methodology I actually <coughs> had was uh, that the questions would always be the same. Like, when did you meet Hans? Uh, what was subsequently, and so on. And then they would tell me uh, how things had, had uh, developed. And Hans was exceptionally loyal to his artist. And uh, they, to them, and I mean, why, why didn't we, maybe that is something to come back to later. Anyway, um, the only methodology I had was to find out um, how long Hans knew these people, because there are no written records, and apart from Hans's letters, um, but there are no written records anywhere of, of when these artists met and what Hans was doing, except the catalogues he published. And the, uh, and, and the archive. And I come to the archive because it is the most important place to see what Hans had collected, how his scholarship evolved. And this is his, his personal archive that he left behind? Um, you can say a personal, I mean, he had personally collected it, but not with a personal, just a personal intention. I think he always knew he was going to do. And he kept records. That was the, that was his nature. He was a fantastic collector of tidbits and, and, and written things written down. He kept, he kept everything, even visiting cards, whatever. That those are also part of it. And then, of course, when he had his consultancy, C A W, um, of the first N A A C, New Amsterdam Art Consultancy. The New Amsterdam is totally cheap, like New York and so on. And um, the, the artists liked that a lot. And later on in 1999, it was CAW, a gallery founded together with IRA and Frank Arterhagen, who became his sponsor and gallery business director very early on in '95, because Hans was no businessman. And there, as we come back slightly to the dealership, to, yes. to the dealership. Um, he, in the beginning, he sold to ambassadors. People like Uli Sieg bought a lot from him. And Uli Sieg never wants to admit it, who is the biggest collector of Chinese art and the initiator of the M Museum in Hong Kong. He would never acknowledge that anyone else, but he did anything to get that exhibition, to get that. But he, I know that he consulted Hans very often and bought uh, paintings and bought artworks from him. Uh, so did other collectors. And he met Hans, Hans met Frank Uitenhagen in 1994 through friends, common friends, Belgian friends, and they became very big friends throughout his life and with his family. And um, without, I think, Hans might have starved maybe without Frank. And um, um, so the dealership was something that he took very seriously, but um, at some point, up till 1997-98, he sold enough, not that frequently, but enough to survive. And, but after that, other galleries started. The Courtyard Gallery uh, was erected in, in Beijing, came to Beijing in 1998. Um, other people came to China and started buying directly from the artists uh, without consulting Hans or and so Hans, Hans's livelihood was dwindling, and he had to go to uh, Hong Kong every three months to renew his visa because he didn't have a, a, a fixed position. He <coughs> tried, he tried very, but you cannot um, have, you cannot found a business in China without a Chinese partner and without an address. So and you cannot get an address. It is a kind of catch twenty two. So, um, we get to 1998, I think, to the Mongolian in China exhibition, um, and to Hans, living as a foreigner. Do you want to talk about how and when you met Hans? Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I remember that was, actually, I didn't even know of his existence in 96. I went, I went to, to Shanghai, and it is due to, due to Hu Han Ru, actually. I wanted to see the art. I went, was invited by Chen Zhen, a very good friend of mine since 1991, um, and a fantastic artist um, who lived in Paris in those days. And um, 
who invited me to come to the first uh, Shanghai Biennial. I remember very well, we were, there, I was, there, there was only one other foreigner, and that was, that was Pierre Hubert, a, collection, a, collectioner from, uh, a collector from Switzerland. And so now, nowadays, Shanghai Art Biennales and all the art biennials in, in China are flooded with thousands of foreigners. But there were, in 1996, there were only two. And um, there was art critic Hu Han Lu, who was absolutely fit, who taught here at the Rex Academy as well. And Hu Han Lu um, introduced me, or he, he organized, as I told him I wanted to go to Beijing, and he organized a translator for me. And basically, thanks to Hu Han Lu and Zhou Kihai, where I met Chinese artists, who, who, who took me to Hangzhou, where I met Zhang Peli and Kong Chen Yi. Um, all these artists I met in those days, when I told them I went to Beijing, they said, oh, you have to visit Hans. I said, Hans who? Okay, so I arrived in, in Beijing with Hans's address and the gallery he had in those days, which was Sifu. Um, a small gallery rented from Kafa, which is the Central Academy, the Chinese Academy in Beijing, and the National Academy. And where in at that moment, there was an exhibition going on by Wang Xingwei, who has become one of the most interesting Chinese artists in his. And Hans sort of uh, received me with open arms going on and on about the iconography and iconology of that was absolutely new and fascinating of Wang Xingwei's paintings. And um, then we went to his apartment on the second ring road. and. Um, he showed me the photographs you see, you saw there, um, and of the of those banners in, in in Hangzhou. And incidentally, the two figures on the left of that the, that banner, that, those were uh, Zhang Peli and Gong Yi, hanging over the railing and looking at the effect of their handiwork. <laughs> and um, so there is so much to, to tell. Just I'm, I'm going on and on. Sorry. I think maybe maybe one last. I think we are, we are uh, running out of time. I'd be interested, more broadly speaking, as an art historian, um, how you look at the relation between an individual story like Hans's life and, and the greater historical and art historical movements, and how those two relate, or this kind of personal lens through which you can tell the story that you told with this book. Um, well, actually, art history starts with subjective stories. It starts with Vasari's Vite. Uh, the, Vasari was an um, artist architect in the 15th century, in um, 16th, 16th century in Italy. And he was the first, he, like Herodotus was said to be the father of journalism, so Vasari is the father of art history because he wrote the lives of the artists, the Italian artists uh, of the Renaissance. So uh, actually, art history starts with, a, with biographies. Mm -hmm. And, um, but history itself, um, I was thinking of, of um, for instance, letters, uh, archives, always are the stuff of history, and also the personal. Actually, there's a famous French um, historian, Emmanuel Leroy Lavery, who, who wrote um, a book about a medieval Qatarian uh, village for, in a, for based on uh, the um, uh, Inquisition on the day-to-day -day, um, description of the life of the villagers by the Inquisition before they set fire to the entire Qatar movement, Qat Qatarian movement, um, and it was sort of the first time that a historian had used those records to describe the lives of people actually. But let it. These. This is like a body of knowledge that is transmitted and itself becomes part of history. And I hope very much that this book will enable Hans to enter the history of Chinese contemporary art and, um, and become one voice amidst the really scandalous commercialism these days um, that upheld values that really are the reason why um, Govern, good government should include art. Mm. Art should, should be part of today's um, culture.
culture should, is an indispensable part of good government, but not as a censorship. Yeah. I think we have time for maybe questions from the audience. Yes. If there are any. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Or anything that came by on the screen that grabbed your attention? These are, or oh, just before, <coughs> these were, uh, in the book yeah. there are um, letters and, and by people, artists and other people who, after Hans died, who they wrote to Hans or about Hans. It's a, it's a sort of necrology. Um, you know, the most memorial part of the book. Okay the most moving moment of the exhibition in Beijing was that I saw people weep leaving the exhibition. That is how much Hans, even after so many years, still moved people so deeply and what he meant for them. Yes. I have a question. I first want to congratulate Marianne with the book. And, and you also as a curator for presenting. Uh, it's, it's wonderful, I've seen it, and I'm just very curious, given the amount of uh, censorship that is still prevalent in China, how is that hurting or making it difficult to distribute the book in China? It's impossible. Ah. It, cannot be, it cannot be published in Chinese before. We do want to have a Chinese um, yeah, yeah, yeah. version if at all possible, because if the money is there and so on, because it is still, even if we, we need to self-censor ourselves, um, the, the part about 1989 is impossible to publish in China. Um, there are other parts. Uh, the, the way things are said, even Hans's article, which was published in 89, uh, has to be edited out. Um, on subtle ways that I don't even know how, how subtle they have to be. But, um, but it is, it, the foreword is by the actual director of the UCCLA yeah. in Beijing, mm. Mr. Tinari. So he was able to write that, but he cannot have that book in his own shop then. Uh, not this book. Uh -huh. no. And actually we've been sort of wary of sending it to China mm. at all. But uh, apparently it's okay if you send it to people's personal addresses. We're, we're testing the waters in we're terms testing. of distribution. Yeah. A big bulk has been sent to Hong Kong, which is still safe. Yeah. And then from there on, but let's not get into the details perhaps. No. Yeah. But, um, but it's, a, it's a challenge also institutionally indeed to, to you know, self-censor is a big issue and not something that to go about lightly. So these are questions that remain. <laughs> But they still think it's worthwhile to publish it in China, even mm. editing out all the sensitive parts. Mm. Yes. Uh, yeah, thanks for a fantastic uh, presentation. And this book it looks so incredibly interesting. Uh, but I, I want to ask you, you, you mentioned the scandalous uh, commercialism on one hand, and then the censorship, obviously, on the other hand. What sort of art is it that reaches let's say, Euro galleries, and how is it sort of chosen? How does it get there? You have seen what, uh, you know, Sotheby's and Christie's and all over the place. That is a very, it, it, it requires quite a lengthy answer, actually. Um, why are, I have seen in Holland uh, displays of Chinese art where you think, my God, it's the equivalent of the, the, the gypsy boy with the tear. Yeah. All the time. It's horrible. That is what people think Chinese art is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is one thing. I wish they would put a bomb on it. Um, I mean, all the, the artists... Well, if you know, commercialism is started maybe... If you know that there's... Um, at the Hangzhou Academy of Art, which has, of course, become ultra-famous, um, there is place for about, um, I think, 1,700 artists each year. Um, but uh, today, there's 17,000 each year that present themselves and want to be, become uh, a student at the Academy. So art has, Chinese art has gone through the world. 
there, there's from the start, the West has always loved chinoiserie. Um, so something with a Chinese touch. Um, you could say it's maybe um, Chinese eyes art or uh, <laughs> whatever you would call it. Uh, as a long, so the whole idea of and it's very complicated because this this Chineseness um, is also a debating thing in China itself. Um, how much Chinese should contemporary art be? Should it be nationalistic or should it be how how what is the form and shape it should have? And that changes according to the political surroundings. Um, actually, fuck off the exhibition by Ivory in, in 2002 um, was one exhibition testing the waters of censorship. Because in those days it was like uh, the, the, the Chinese government had decided that, the, um, um, that it was much more lucrative to be lenient on art. Um, then to censor everything that went abroad. So until 2000 or so, you couldn't export Chinese art, it was forbidden. Hans had to go through um, you know, making it uh, examples or, or furniture or that kind of label it differently. And, um, yeah? Yeah, I just had one question because I lived in Hong Kong uh -huh. at the time. And a lot of uh, Chinese art came through Hong Kong, uh, yeah. and we, we started buying in 1996. Uh, yeah. You just said that it was prohibited? It, requires, I think we, I, it was easy to buy. I think it requires art. creativity for it to leave the country. There yeah. was no system that was labeled a system of contemporary art in well, which it could be... It was forbidden to, to ship um, contemporary art as such. Uh, as such. Yeah, You couldn't export it. It was forbidden. So to any country. Yeah. So I wonder how... Uh, 96 was... How it, because there was a fair, the very first art fair in Hong Kong, which exhibited um, uh, many of these artists. Um, 93 the even, there was the famous, yeah. the famous exhibition in Hong Kong, in with Wong Kong Yi and so on, and, yeah. and later on in Venice, in the, the, at the Biennale, was the Chinese. But you had to ship them officially labeled furniture or theater props or whatever. Oh, okay. I just wondered how they, how they... Yeah. Yeah, we wondered as well in those days how they got to, uh, how they got to Hong Kong. But I la they later on learned from Hansen shipper. He had a special, um, who did all his shipments to uh, international shipments. And he told me how, how things reached their destiny. Yes. Marianne, um, can I ask you, um, is there, can you tell something about the archive of Hans van Dijk? Is there a certain place where the archive is concentrated? Can you visit that? Is that in Hong Kong at the, at the uh, Chinese archive or is it another place? And the can you see some place, of his work? Some, some, there some is a physical archive, but uh, that is not uh, accessible anymore. It has been restored. It's, uh, but um, the place to go and visit the archive is now a virtual archive in, at the Asian Art um, yeah. Archive in yeah. Hong Kong. Yeah. yeah, but you have so, to go there so first. That's the place. And that is a problem for many Chinese students who have no money to go to Hong Kong, right. and, um, but who want to study Hans, uh, Hans's archive. Right. So, um, yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. I feel. Okay. If there are no further questions, then I'd like to thank all of you for attending. I'd like to thank Marianne once more. And I'm very happy to. <laughs> the book is available for sale uh, here at the fair at the Witte de Wit booth, which is just downstairs, uh, or online or at Witte de Wit. Do visit both the booth and uh, the exhibitions we have currently on as well. Thank you very much.